Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mary Redfern. I'm the curator of the East Asian collection at the Chester BT, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today. And thank you for joining us on what is mostly a sunny afternoon. Um, it's great to have you with us. If you are new to the Chester BT, please do sign up for our What's On newsletter on our website, and this will tell you about all the different lectures, talks, and activities we have going on. Um, we're also, of course, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so find us wherever you can, and we'll keep in touch. Um, and this is actually a really important moment for us at the Chester BT. It's, it's our first event to be held during Dublin Pride. And as staff at the Chester BT, so <clears throat> myself, my colleagues, we've all been keenly aware of the many stories that our incredible collections have to tell. And we've started to tell some of those stories, to explore those, but we're really taking our first steps in the area of expanding the narratives um, that we can present within the space of a museum. So in terms of holding an event for Dublin Pride, we wanted to sort of take those first steps in the best direction possible. So I got in touch with Richard, uh, my former teacher when I was at Leicester, and he introduced us then to the wonderful Chris, who I am delighted to say are both here to speak with us today, and also to highlight the Chester Beatty collections within this context also. So to briefly introduce our speakers more formally, Chris Reed is a PhD candidate at Ulster University working on the post-conflict museum activism within the context of queer heritage. He's worked for the National Trust and Historic Royal Palaces in public engagement and developed a monthly LGBTQ plus tour at Hillsborough Castle and Gardens. And I've heard so many glowing reviews of this tour that I really can't wait for the opportunity to go and see it for myself. So I would highly recommend that for you all for the future also. Richard Sandell is professor in the School of Museum Studies at the University of Leicester, which is where I came across him many years ago now. Uh, not that many, maybe not. Uh, he's also co-director for the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries. And Leicester has a really excellent programme in museum studies, looking at the role of the museum really across the board, across the spectrum, what potential they have and what we can develop. And for Richard, his research explores the potential of museums and heritage in terms of supporting human rights, social justice and equality. Incredibly important works, I'm sure you'll all agree, and in his case, groundbreaking research that he's doing in this area. Both Richard and Chris are very happy to answer questions at the end of the talk. We've disabled the chat, but if you can put any questions you have into the Q&A box, we'll address as many as we can in the time available. And with that, I shall hand over to Richard and Chris, and thank you both for joining us, and thank you all for coming to listen today. Thanks so much, Mary, um, for that uh, kind introduction, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, Chris and I were absolutely delighted when we got the call from the team at the Chester BT, inviting us to take a look at their amazing collections and to shine a queer spotlight on them, especially for Dublin Pride. Over the last few years, more and more cultural institutions have been looking at their previously untold queer or LGBTQ plus histories. And Chris and I have had the opportunity to be involved in some of that work, developing tours, exhibitions and events that have generated lots of interest and support from the public, but which in some cases have also prompted a backlash, a backlash from, from some politicians, some parts of the media, some visitors, uh, staff and volunteers who would prefer the many queer connections in our museums, our libraries, our heritage sites to be kept quiet and to be kept hidden away. Of course, this backlash, these negative responses only go to show why it's so important for us to openly explore and discuss histories of gender diversity and same sex love and desire. Indeed, places like the Chester Beatty, by celebrating queer histories and perspectives, have a really important role to play in shaping the kinds of conversations that we have about equality, diversity and inclusion in and beyond Ireland in 2021. Today, we're going to take a glimpse at some of the Chester Beatty's rich collection of objects and documents, and we're going to look through a queer lens as we do that. And by doing so, we'll see that LGBTQ plus lives have always existed, that they're prevalent throughout history. And by shifting our perspective ever so slightly, we can discover a whole range of stories waiting to be told. The diversity of the Chester Beatty collection in particular provides us with the opportunity to take this even further, challenging our own fixed Western perspectives of gender and sexuality 
um, by looking at cultures and practices that have existed for millennia. Before we get started, we'd like to ask all of you a question. So let's get this up for, on the screen for you. If you could take a close look at, at these three images uh, for, a, for a minute or so, we'd like to ask you this question. Which of these items from the Chester BT do you think might be considered queer? So without knowing the background to any of these uh, images in detail, can you guess which of them might be included in our queer history tour today? If you take a close look, because we're going to um, bring up a poll in a few seconds and you'll get a chance to place your votes. So if you've had a close look, um, we'll bring up the poll now and you should be able to see and make a choice around um, images A, B and C. So which of these items do you think might be considered queer and might appear in our queer history tour to follow? If you can click on um, any of those options, um, take a moment to do that before we get started. I'll give you a minute to do that. So whilst the, whilst the votes are coming in, um, we will get started in a second. It's our hope today that by looking at the Chester Beatty collection through a prism of gender and sexuality, that we can enhance the stories associated with these objects and develop our own understandings of queerness in the 21st century using this rich heritage of our past. And as we'll see, queer identity and attitudes attitudes to queer people haven't followed a linear uh, progression from oppression to liberation, but instead progress has been made, progress has been lost, attitudes have evolved and attitudes have regressed. And despite some important legal milestones, which we'll touch on, LGBTQ plus rights remains a highly contested subject around the globe. So maybe we can take a look and see which of those objects you thought might appear. So we'll see if the results of the polling are in. Okay, quite a good spread across those objects. Image A is uh, slightly in the lead with 52% of you picking that one, but good numbers across all the board. So that's helpful. Well, let's get started and we'll see which of those um, appear. And um, I hope you enjoy the tour to follow. I'll hand over to my colleague, Chris. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Richard. And um, I just want to echo what Richard has said. Um, it has been such a pleasure and such a privilege to research these objects. It is the most incredible collection, and we're incredibly lucky to have it here in Ireland. So thank you so much to the wonderful team at the Chester BD uh, for giving us this chance. Um, okay, so the first object we're going to look at is this one. Um, and for those of you that uh, said object A. Congratulations, you were right. Um, uh, this is an engraving by the German artist Albrecht Dürer, um, and it depicts the Christian martyr Saint Sebastian, who was a Roman soldier who was executed during the persecution of Christians by the Emperor Diocletian in AD 288. Uh, venerated for his commitment to the Christian faith, images of his barely clothed body riddled with arrows have been reproduced by artists for centuries. And now he's known formally as the patron saint of soldiers and athletes, as well as a protector from plague, most notably during the Black Death of the 14th century. Um, but despite these more official titles, he is also closely associated with queerness, both historically and in the present day. And whilst there doesn't appear to be any suggestion that Sebastian himself was queer, it's his image that has evolved over the centuries to become the LGBTQ plus icon that we know today. Um, but why is this the case? Well, by the 16th century, when this example was created, Renaissance artists like Albrecht Dürer were following a trend of sexualizing religious figures in their work, with Saint Sebastian being one of only a few socially acceptable religious depictions of the male nude. So for example, a contemporary of Dürer, the artist Fra Bartolomeo, uh, was said to have painted a likeness of Saint Sebastian for a church in Florence that was so enticing that people sinned at the sight of it due to the charm and melting beauty of its subject, leading to its removal from public view. 
His pained expression as he is penetrated by arrows has endured for half a millennium as the idealized and sexualized male body and as a symbol of same-sex desire. Derek Jarman's 1976 film, Sebastian, for example, explores these homoerotic themes by making Saint Sebastian an object of desire to other male Roman soldiers, whilst the artist Gehindi Wiley replaces the piercing arrows with a body penetrated by tattoos in an examination of black masculinity and identity in the 21st century. Right. As I mentioned before, there doesn't appear to be any debate around the sexuality of St. Sebastian himself. However, the application of queerness to objects and symbols that may not have been created with this intention has very much been a necessary aspect of many LGBTQ plus lives for most of history. When the mere existence of queerness was being criminalized, queer folk turned to imagery that could be interpreted in a way that represented same-sex love and gender diversity. Uh, another engraving by Albrecht Durer in the Chester Beatty collection can be interpreted in this way. Um, now, some of you may be familiar with the context of this piece, but I want us all just to take a moment and consider what we're seeing, just what we're seeing right in front of us. And for me, it is simply two men sharing a kiss. And when I look at this, I see a brief moment of intimacy and love that's being encroached upon by the angry faces of a baying mob in the background, which is very, very queer indeed. Now, in fact, this particular piece is called The Betrayal, and it depicts Judas kissing Christ before his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. But for LGBTQ plus folk whose identities rarely feature overtly in historic paintings, we look to images such as this one as a way of seeing ourselves reflected back, irrespective of the artist's intent. We can assume it was never the artist's intention to suggest that Judas and Christ were queer, but if the intended subject matter of this piece had been same-sex love or desire, it's very difficult to believe that it would have survived to this day. And in 2021, there are still 71 countries that criminalize same-sex sexual activity, 11 of which hold the death penalty, and 15 countries that actively criminalize trans identities. And while things have moved on here in Ireland, it's important to remember that male homosexual acts were illegal in Ireland until 1993, which is very recent, and trans people continue to face social and legal marginalization. And today, across the globe, there are still those who seek different kinds of queer representation in a way that is safe and affirming, which offers them a history when this has been systemically denied to them. So we're going to now take a look at some of the Eastern collection in the Chester BD, uh, which offers us a really fascinating insight into historic practices of same-sex love and gender diversity that hopefully challenge our own very Western perspectives on queer lives in the past and the present. And what's really interesting about these examples is that the intended story behind some of them is and can be very much interpreted as queer. Now, before we continue, it's important to understand that conceptions of gender and sexuality in the past and across cultures are different to how we might understand them today. Indeed, in some instances, they would not be acceptable in our modern world. Sexuality, for example, was viewed by many as something you did as opposed to something you were. And furthermore, attitudes to age of consent and the gendered roles of sexual and romantic relationships require nuanced and critical reflection when observed from a 21st century perspective. And this is particularly true of the Japanese practice of namshaku, as alluded to in this 18th century woodblock print showing two male youths playing flutes. And you can actually see this at the moment in the museum's Edwin Color exhibition, which runs until the 5th of December. You can also see it online in a really, really, really good virtual tour. Um, and it was purchased by the Chester Beatty. This piece was purchased by the Chester Beatty um, to better represent Nan Shaku in the collection. And this practice refers to a form of pederasty or the relationship between men and adolescent boys, particularly amongst the samurai and monastic communities of pre 20th century Japan. And this association with social institutions that were primarily based upon loyalty, 
solidarity and brotherhood meant the practice of nunshaku was an acceptable form of same-sex relationship in these settings, as evidenced by the sheer volume of surviving artworks depicting it. Now, traditionally, the younger partner took a passive sexual role and formed a mentor-protege relationship with an adult male who educated him in life skills, with this arrangement expected to end once the adolescent reached adulthood. This piece in particular accompanies uh, a poem that references the mating calls of male birds, while the imagery of two male youths playing flutes is intended to have sexual illusions. In Edo period Japan, which is the, the early 17th to mid 19th centuries, these youths were known as wakashu, a title only afforded to the brief period between childhood and adulthood in meals. And in this piece, a brightly dressed male youth clutches a branch of cherry blossom with petals falling onto his robe. And this often repeated motif alludes to the fleeting beauty of the cherry blossom and the brief period in which a young male can be considered wakashu. Often dressed in more feminine attire, a shaved spot in their hair made them identifiable to contemporary audiences, setting them apart in many ways as neither male nor female for that period. And scholars have described this group as a third gender for their androgynous appearance and desirability amongst both adult men and women. There are numerous representations of them in Edo period artwork, which suggests a social intrigue and acceptance of this practice in Japanese culture at that time. Now, there's, of course, a lot to unpick when considering the practice of nanshaku and the wakashi identity. Most importantly is to acknowledge that this group were what we, we would now consider to be children, and the practice is no longer accepted in modern day Japan. And this is a really important ethical consideration when we look at collections such as this. How do we interpret practices that are now considered wrong? Similar conversations are taking place in Ireland about Roger Casement, for example, whose black diaries suggest he had sexual relationships with underage boys as well as adult men, and this has been the subject of much investigation and debate. There are, of course, or these are, of course, difficult questions, but ones we can't ignore if we're going to try and tell these stories meaningfully. It is, however, fascinating that the concept of a third gender existed and was in many ways accepted in Edo period Japan. And, and for me, this really challenged the, the fixed binary perceptions that some of us have of sex and gender. And in fact, today, the loudest voices in opposition to trans and non-binary identities will often dismiss them as a modern phenomenon or fad. But what these objects show us is that human beings have never followed strict rules of what constitutes gender. And it's instead the prevailing attitudes and cultural expectations of society that dictate accessibil acceptability of gender diversity. Other examples in the East Asian collection explore this theme of gender diversity and fluidity. Uh, this piece, for example, depicts a scene from the 18th century Chinese classical novel, Dream of the Red Chamber. And um, in it, we see the principal character, Bao Yu, dreaming of playing with his female cousins when he's meant to be studying. As heir apparent to his aristocratic family's dynasty, this scene represents shifting expressions of feminine and masculine norms values conflict between the expectation of his gender and his own desires can be seen to challenge ingrained binary expectations of how different genders should behave or feel. This is also true of uh, cultural expectations around gender and dress. And um, in these beautiful Japanese examples from 1822, uh, we see two women in full battle gear, a traditionally masculine role and attire. Uh, Lady Tomoe Gosen on the left was a 12th century warrior of the historical Genpai Wars, who was subsequently mythologized, uh, and Princess Kamanatsugi, who stands before a spider's web on the right, was said to combine magical powers with warrior skill, turning outlaws into spiders and then killing them without difficulty. Um, and we also see similar examples of this in the museum's Western collection. Um, in the early years of the 20th century, uh, women began to flout traditional gender dress in numerous ways, including adapting men's clothing to allow them to participate 
in a wider range of sport, as can be seen in this French example. And we might assume that, that how we present our gender identity has remained strict and binary, that the division of what is considered masculine and feminine is unchanging. But when looking at these examples from the past, it's, it's so clear that this was not necessarily always the case and highlights the culturally constructed and fluid nature of gender expression. So the next, these images, I adore these. Um, these are a set of fans that were designed by French illustrators, Paul Oribe and George Barbier, and they encapsulate the art deco genre of the early 20th century. And Barbier was part of a stylish fashion forward artistic circle who Vogue aptly named in 1940, the Beau Brummels of the Brush, referencing the famous Regency dandy who was known for his elegant sense of style. Living in the bohemian art world of Paris, Barbier immersed himself in a burgeoning queer culture, which undoubtedly influenced his work. Often featuring fashionable women, his art has represented female intimacy and queerness with illustrations of women falling in love with one another and living independently of men following the First World War. This next example from the Chester Beatty collection captures the highly feminized nature of Barbier's artwork, which often featured gender fluid and non-binary characters um, or females in traditionally masculine attire and gender roles. The two pairs of dancers that you see here are dressed in traditionally male and female attire. But upon closer inspection, the scene becomes much more ambiguous and their gender more difficult to decipher. And this is an oft repeated and intentional element of Barbier's work. In fact, throughout the 1920s, he went on to create graphic illustrations depicting female sexuality and queerness with overtly lesbian themes, relegating men as largely unimportant aspects of his work. Where men do feature, they're often secondary or background fillers to the dominance and indifference of powerful women, as can be seen in these prints from the collection. And following his death in 1932, Barbier's name fell into obscurity and the first posthumous exhibition of his work did not take place until 2008. Why this is the case is unclear. Did the onset of war and move away from Art Deco mean he was simply out of fashion? Or is it the case that growing conservatism in 20th century Europe meant the tolerance and acceptance of queer women in art had declined? It's true that the history of queer women is often erased from the narrative, as is the case for women's history in general. This is of course rooted in misogyny and the general oppression of women throughout history. Women's sexuality has been hushed and suppressed with some scholars suggesting that the concept of same-sex love and desire between women was deemed impossible by those in the past because what could they possibly have done without a man present, people would ask. Um, like a fascinating contemporary of George Barbier was the Danish artist Gerda Wegner, who practiced in Paris in the early 20th century. Sought after for her society portraits, she also designed fashion plates and illustrations for popular magazines like this one. And the sitter for this particular example is unknown, but it is thought by some to be her partner, Lily Elba, who often sat as a model for her work. And Lily is famous for undergoing the first publicized gender reassignment surgery and whose life is the subject of a posthumously published biography entitled Man into Woman. The relationship between Gerda and Lily was fictionalized in the popular book and later film, The Danish Girl, which sparked an important debate around trans representation in the film and whether these roles, as was the case in this film, should be played by cisgender actors. Following her transition, Lily and Gerda's marriage was annulled as same-sex marriage was not recognized at that time. And Wegener's art also explored lesbian themes and their relationship for me especially is a really enduring example of the complexities of love, gender and sexuality. So the next person we're gonna look at um, is the Chevalier Daniel, who was an individual who lived openly as a man and as a woman at different stages in their life in 18th century France and England. 
Born to a minor aristocratic family in Burgundy, the Chevalier worked as a spy and diplomat for King Louis XV before seeking political exile in London after falling out with a superior. Publishing a scandalous book entitled Lettre et Memoir et Negotium, filled with secret diplomatic documents, the Chevalier became a well-known figure in London. Now at that time, there had long been rumors that they were in fact a woman, despite at that time presenting as a man. And by, 19, and by 1777, they were permanently presenting as female and were performing fencing exhibitions as a means of generating income. This particular example that you can see comes from the Rare Books collection at the Chester Beatty and quite literally splits down, down the middle, presenting them as both male and female. And actually, if you do a bit of research or look into the Chevalier, this is a representation of them that you do often see, this almost celebration um, of who they were in some instances, but other examples that are not so kind. Um, now, this book uh, was written by Henry Angelo, who was an English fencing master and contemporary of the Chevalier. And in this watercolour by Thomas Rowlandson from the Welcome Collection, we can see Dayon in female attire, fencing at Angelo's Fencing Academy sometime in the late 1780s. Now, despite their fame, Dayon died in poverty in 1810 at the age of 81. And as the British Museum has noted, tracing their story is not easy. And in particular, it's difficult to apply modern titles and identities to an individual from the past. For some, the Chevalier represents a trans identity, for others, non-binary. But whichever the case, their story is clearly one of gender, diversity, and queerness. So I'm just gonna hand back over to Richard now. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I'm going to hand back over to well, we very much hope you've enjoyed the stories we've looked at today. As we said, it's just a, a glimpse, really. We've had a first foray into those collections. Um, and I know Chris and I really enjoyed researching them and bringing them together for this special, in, special Dublin Pride event. So we've only scratched the surface and there are many more queer objects and interpretations and possibilities to be unearthed and to be shared. And we hope that this work will continue both at the Ch Chester Beatty and beyond Cultural organisations of all kinds have a really important part to play in championing, championing and building support for LGBTQ plus equality today. More than simply repositories of the past, places like the Chester Beatty can foster dignity and respect towards LGBTQ plus people. They can help to challenge ongoing prejudice and stigma around gender diversity and same sex love and desire. And this is important, we would suggest, not just for LGBTQ people, but for all of us, the way we come together today to know our past and shape a more equitable and inclusive future. So thanks very much for coming today. We've got a little bit of time for some questions, comments, reflections, and we'd love to hear from you. So I'll hand back to you now, Mary, and uh, we'll see if we have any questions or comments to get us started. Thanks very much. Thank you very much and thank you both Chris and Richard. I do have to say a special thanks here because normally when we invite people to speak, we invite people to speak about their own collections, their own research. And in this case, um, Chris and Richard have really pulled a blinder in terms of actually going through the Chester Beatty collections and finding new stories for us. And then producing such a beautifully choreographed presentation of it all as well. So very deep personal thanks from me, um, but also some really positive responses already coming through in the Q&A. So just a reminder to everybody, if you have any questions, put them into the Q&A box. I'll get through as many as we can in the time available. Um, but the first thing is to say, just in case anyone missed that, all of the items in that quiz belong in this presentation. They all have queer histories they can share. They all reflect aspects of queer um, identity or can be useful to queer communities mm -hmm. in terms of finding those identities. So, and that's really what we found even through talking with Richard and Chris at the beginning is just the huge potential for this across our collections. You know, there are some things that, that relate very specifically, but also things that just reflect something or capture something that is really important to be able to pick up on today. So the sky is the limit in terms of queer histories in museums, I would say. So 
Okay, there's a couple of questions here for me, which I can probably pick up on very easily. Okay, so I'll just do, thank you for the very interesting talk from the Royal Library of Belgium there and really interesting stories. Thank you so much. So a couple of people have asked, will we be seeing a special exhibition upcoming at the Chester Beatty or perhaps an app or a guide to the collection that points out queer subject matter? So the first thing I'd like to say is obviously this is a first step for us and it is very specifically a first step of what we hope will be many um, productive steps forward. So we'll be putting this this talk online, um, but we're also going to be creating a sort of online exhibition, a small web page that will pick up on some of the objects and the stories that have been discussed today. And that too will give us a starting point for more in the future. So we're very open to, to hear from people and to make new connections and to explore these incredible collections that we have and such global collections, such global histories that we have here. Um, so many people want more. Okay, we're going to be very busy. <laughs> In terms of specific questions, I'll try and catch a couple of those. Uh, so someone has asked, um, was Albrecht Dürer himself also thought to be perhaps homosexual or bisexual? Chris, I wonder if you might know that. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really allude to that in the talk, but there, there are a number of academic articles written about his sexuality or that certainly suggest he was part of a, I suppose, a bit of a queer circle of his time. Um, he spent a lot of time in Italy and it was around that time in the Renaissance period when they were um, homoeroticizing a lot of art. And there are a number of his pieces. I, I tried to find one in the collection that I thought looked very much overtly queer, but there's a couple, uh, um, there's one, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a, it's a group of men signed together at what looks like a bathhouse maybe or something like that. And there's a lot of strategically placed taps and things and it's, it's, a, it's quite a fun uh, piece. Um, but that's one of the main examples people use that, yes, they do suggest that he might have been, I suppose, what we would now consider to be bisexual. Um, I, I don't know lots more than that on it, but I do know, yes, it's definitely, definitely part of the conversation. And I do think that it 110% <clears throat> influenced his work, um, as can be seen in the very ripped St. Sebastian example that we had from the, the Jester Beatty's collection. Got more lovely feedback coming in. So love seeing this happening at the Chester Beatty. Excellent presentation, fascinating stories. We'd love to see more. Okay, we've definitely got a long way to go with this, I would say. Um, and also just for myself, I think one of the other things that very early on when I was an undergraduate back in this really is in the mists of time now, I did archeology. span And when I was doing archeology, span we found out that a lot of graves when the bones didn't survive were basically assigned a gender based on what was buried with them. And it was, it was these kinds of practices, these kinds of assumptions permeate so much of our construction of history and so much of our construction of heritage. And then at the Chester Beatty, one of the most entertaining parts of my job has recently been being where we have figures that are actually these young male youths, the Wakashu, beautifully dressed, beautifully attired, very luxuriant forelocks, and they've been described as women. And it's actually these mistaken identities that I think also have lost us so much. So I guess the question I'm sort of building to is, is how much um, do you think has been lost and how, how often do you find stories that have almost been hidden in plain sight when you've been doing your research? But you start <laughs> yeah I think that um I think that there are so many examples of things that have been lost and I think that that's one of the big challenges of of this work and um, I think as well you're trying to bring people along to this idea that actually this isn't this isn't us um going out of our way to contrive things it's that as you say they have always been there and we're almost trying to uh, to resolve historic wrongs that have been committed in a way um, I mean that's certainly been my experience I don't know if you're the same Richard yeah I think some of this work has been I can't remember who said this but sort of likened to uh, detective work really because you know in so many ways as you alluded to Mary the um, queerness has been purposefully or inadvertently uh, erased or suppressed for a whole range of different reasons. And so quite often what happens, I think when you're doing this work, there's a little bit of instinct that kicks in and you think that looks a bit queer, could it be queer? Are there queer connections? And then 
um, you, you sort of go off from there really and you have to do some digging and you do have to sort of look differently really. I mean I saw Kira's lovely comment in and question sort of saying oh so really the all of the three in our kind of opening quiz could be considered queer and of, of course you know what uh, it's a great point because what we tried to do in that in that selection in, in on our selection of the tour as a whole was kind of show the different ways of looking queerly so that it's not simply is the subject or was the artist lesbian or gay do we know that do we have to know it is there a smoking gun do we know for certain before we can say it um, or are there a whole other range of ways of looking queerly at collections um, to try and surface some of those richer contexts and histories which are so easily suppressed so yeah more detective work and we did a bit of it and you helped as Mary and your um, colleagues with your great knowledge of the collections gave us some brilliant clues and then we we went to um, digging further. Okay, so we've got a very good question actually coming from a couple of people. Um, are there any things you would recommend to read? Any good places for people to start who are looking to get a bit more background or find out a bit more about queer histories and queer contexts? Well, I'll kick off with one suggestion and then I'm sure you've got others, Chris. Um, uh, Chris and I were talking earlier about uh, Richard Parkinson's book, A Little, a Little Gay History, I think, which um, comes out of his time at the British Museum and was the uh, inspiration for the British Museum's first queer history exhibition. You can find that, that there's a book by Richard Parkinson, um, but you can also Google um, Love, Desire, Identity at the British Museum and some uh, a similar kind of wide range of um, objects looking at queerness over the whole world through uh, through time is, is a great introduction to kind of looking queerly and looking at different queer histories. And there's also, um, uh, I was part of a project with uh, the National Trust. It's great to see some colleagues here today as well. Um, there was a national public programme called Prejudice and Pride and um, a publication that looks across the National Trust's portfolio. There's a couple of publications. One you can get, um, uh, download for free on our website it's called prejudice and pride lgbtq histories and their contemporary implications and there's also a, na a national trust guidebook that again reveals those queer histories across their 500 or so properties what would you recommend chris um yeah i mean i suppose just to add to those um if you're interested in the irish context um there's a really great book that's kind of a, an overview uh, called terrible queer creatures by uh, brian lacy um and it's it's fascinating. It's also very it's quite entertaining to read as well. So I'd, I'd really recommend it. And if you're interested um, in art, um, the Tate did a fabulous exhibition called Queer British Art in 2017. And there's a beautiful publication of it. People keep buying me it as a present. So if anybody wants it, I have several <laughs> copies of it. Um, but it's brilliant. It's like to me, it's a really lovely template for how um, artwork can be interpreted in that way so those would be my two two big ones and obviously what Richard mentioned and if you're interested in uh, museum interpretation in particular just read everything Richard writes because it's great. <laughs> Definitely second that recommendation. Um, now a question for you both, very difficult question, what are your favourite works that you have encountered within the Chester Beatty's collection? Oof, that is quite a tough one. I, for me I am um, I had not been exposed to uh, the, the amount of, of Eastern art that you have in your collection before. A lot of the work that I've done in the past has been on Western collections. Um, so for me, that was a real treat and, and such an eye-opening experience. Um, I am always drawn to the aesthetics of these things, but I think with the story behind them, um, you know, that whole world was fascinating to me. And I think there's so much more to be uncovered in it. Um, I think it definitely, definitely challenges um, the kind of fixed, I think I said this in the talk, kind of fixed narratives we had around, have around gender in particular. I think there's a real opportunity there to tease that out. Um, I suppose in terms of, of my favourite pieces, though, I really loved the, the George Barbier um, Art Deco pieces. I just thought they were really beautiful, 
And when I started researching him and, and the way in which he, he created his work, um, it all made sense, it all clicked. And I think that, um, yeah, I think he's somebody that's just, his work is just beautiful. And I, I loved looking at it in your collection. It was gorgeous. What about you, Richard? Yeah, similar. It's a tough one, isn't it? Because there's such a brilliant array. I have to say, I was thrilled when we went on a call last week with um, Mary and we saw the Gerda Wegner, the Lily Elba piece as the sort of poster piece. But it's absolutely beautiful. Um, it's such a stunning work, but also it kind of was quite a powerful, um, sort of intriguing one to be the kind of poster piece for this opening uh, event. So I really fell for that one too, but so many to choose from. And as a sort of follow on question for that, um, do you think from what you've been finding here, as you said, you, you've mostly been familiar with Western collections before, so working with East Asian objects is, is a slightly different area, but would you say that you there seem to be more queer depictions in non-European cultural items that in a way that bias is, is very different when we step outside the European context. Yeah, I, I, th I think so. I, I definitely think so. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a real opportunity there to interpret that in lots of different ways. I mean, one of the things that Richard and I had talked about in the very, very early stages that we didn't really include in the talk is actually looking at some of these things from a colonial perspective as well. You know, it's not the case with all the, the countries in your collection, but there are some instances where Western perspectives have been forced in other countries. And actually a lot of those Western perspectives were um, particularly negative towards queer identities or identities and practices that they deemed to be barbaric um, and didn't align with a kind of Western um, traditionally Christian valued structure um, so I think 110% there's lots in there and um, there's loads around the gender diversity in particular and um, I'd, I'd need to do more to see if there's 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 more around same sex love and relationships and um, but but 110% and uh, without a doubt I think the concepts of gender in a number of those countries is much more um, much more nuanced than what we are perhaps used to in the western world I've just had a shout out to the um opening of Beyond the Binary at Pitt Rivers Museum as uh, a new exhibition. If you uh, Google that, you can get um, some really great glimpses there, um, which give us some kind of um, really fascinating uh, insights into these um, issues and are in different, different parts of the world, different cultures and so on through through space and time. So do have a look, it's called Beyond the Binary. It's just opened in the real world post lockdown um, at the Pitt Rivers in Oxford. And you can also catch there, there's fantastic um, new art installations by um, Matt Smith, who is a sort of a trailblazer in terms of queering museums. So you get to see uh, two for the price of one there and quite a lot of it online as well. And, and there's a couple of questions that have come through which are probably I will take these on. Um, so the first question is, do we think that Chester Beatty was aware of the queer aspects of some of the items in the collection? And um, where was the other one? Are there any overtly same sex uh, images in the museum's collection that aren't shown? So what we can say about Chester Beatty is generally we have, um, and having done just done an exhibition of Japanese prints, we don't generally have uh, very many explicit erotic works or explicit depictions um, within the Chester Beatty collections. This is something that Beatty seems to have avoided. There are always exceptions to this. Um, so it's not that we aren't showing our Japanese extensive Shunga collection, it's that we don't have one. Um, and that would apply to a sort of overtly sexual images of same sex as well. Um, Looking at some of the other things in the collection, I think there would definitely have been things that Beatty wasn't aware of at all because scholars weren't aware of them at all until really quite recently. So depictions like images of the Wakashu in Japanese prints and Japanese paintings um, would just have been taken as showing women 
in beautiful dresses. And it was only sort of later scholars who pointed out that those women were carrying swords, which in itself is not an issue, but also had a shaved spot on their forehead, which very clearly is something that only happened to male youths in Japan. So sort of these distinctions took a lot of time for Western scholarship because Western scholars weren't looking for them. They didn't appreciate that there were differences of gender and differences of sexuality within the artworks they were buying, collecting and absorbing. Um, it wasn't always recognised um, by the scholars or the collectors who were collecting those. Um, and there was one other part on the Chester Beatty side. Um, oh yes, yeah, so are there any depictions of Hydra, the third gender from India in the museum's collection? And this is where I have to say, I don't know. Uh, part of the Indian collection I look after and part of the Indian collection is looked after by my colleague Moya Kerry, the curator of our Islamic collections. And what we are really doing is, as I said, we're at the very starting point, but we know that there is so much more in these incredible collections that we have to uncover. So we will be putting the results of, or sort of some of the content from this presentation into an online um, exhibition webpage, as I said, but it really is a starting point for us. We want to explore our collections more. We want to make more connections, bring as many different voices into the museum as we can, because you know the whole potential of the museum um, as someone has written in a comment, is that the collection is a living thing in a way with new things always to be discovered and reconsidered. And that's why I work in museums. If they were static, I wouldn't be here. They're here, I'm here because the collection has so much potential to give and so much potential to offer and share. And it's true for heritage across the world. Like we have these very recent histories, these gains, these challenges, as Richard said, it's not a linear history. And that potential for change is a potential that lies with all of us. And it's if we can use museum collections towards that, use heritage towards that, that's an incredibly powerful thing, I would say. Um, so I think we've just hit two o'clock, so I will wrap it up there. Um, we have more questions here, which haven't had time to get to, so I'm very sorry if we didn't get to those. Um, but as I said, this is a starting point keep an eye on us we'll be back with more at some point um and it's been fantastic so my huge thanks to Richard and to Chris for all the work they've put in today for guiding us through these incredible objects and their stories and really highlighting the importance of this step for museums um for cultural organizations everywhere but also for our audiences you know we want to bring you all on this incredible journey with us so we look forward to doing that in the weeks months years to come and i'll just see if chris richard if you have anything else you'd like to say before we close out um i think you brought that to a, a a terrific end just to say it's been it has been a real pleasure and it's kind of a real um journey of discovery for us and what's i think is really nice is that it is just the kind of front door in to then so many other possibilities so we'd love to stay in touch with you on that and thanks for giving us the opportunity it's great to see you all thanks for coming today Yep, just echo that. Thank you so much. It's an amazing collection and we're also lucky to have it here. Um, I can't wait to get down to Dublin very, very soon and, and see a lot of it in person. So thank you so much, really, truly.